It's the injury every athlete fears. Associated with a central surgery and a year on the sidelines, a ruptured anterior cruciate ligament has a devastating effect on those who suffer it. With post-operative re-rupture rates as high as one in three, and just half of patients returning to their previous levels within two years, I'm on a mission to discover if there's a better way to recovery. And with the rise of women's sport unequally blighted by ACL injuries, I also want to know how we can prevent this often innocuous injury from occurring so frequently. I think I've found some solutions that whisper them around surgeons. You might be able to return to the activity you love quicker without going under the knife. And hold on to your tin hats. We're now learning that a ruptured ACL can heal naturally. Join me as I speak to the professionals using groundbreaking research to lead the way in challenging the overdependency on surgery. Plus, hear from a raft of athletes who have already followed this alternative pathway, the non-operative. Here is an interview I'm especially excited to share with you as my next guest is one of the main reasons I'm sat here talking about a successful non-operative ACL recovery. Dr. Kieran Richardson has challenged the status quo of the medical industry around ACL rehabilitation and natural healing by re-examining the research and applying his revised learnings to practice, enabling him to return thousands of athletes to sport non-operatively. While most physicians sit on the fence on this subject, Kieran speaks candidly about the motivating factors behind the high operative rates, which account for a $7 billion industry in America alone, suggesting that at least half of us could avoid going under the knife rather than paying the price for an unsubstantiated treatment model whilst being deprived of the chance of natural healing. I hope you find his perspective as valuable as I did. You've become a leading voice, um, certainly in, in um, Australia and New Zealand, in challenging the status quo around the treatment of ACL injuries. Why do you think the subject needs more attention? Yeah, look, it's just pulling back a step. I probably, even around 10 years ago, I was pretty ambivalent towards this topic. I guess I'd had a feeling that there would be some patients that would benefit with surgery and some patients, patients who would be fine without surgery, but really I kind of almost stumbled into it as I was going through my specialist training. So I had these, these different cases that were contrasting one who was successful without surgery, one who was successful, um, who failed surgery. And then it made me look at, into the literature, but I guess I probably, once I'd had those two contrasting cases, looked into the research literature and then just took a look at the world around me, especially in Australia where we have the highest rates of reconstruction in the world per capita. I guess I just started to realize that patients were being over-serviced with surgery and that there was a large group of patients who could do very well without surgery, but perhaps weren't being told that and didn't know there was another option or other options. And so once I had identified the research that was high quality and saw that that was mismatched between what I was seeing in real time in general population and what we see in sports world and what we see in, in every day as a specialist physiotherapist now working with patients in clinical practice, I just started to realize that there was this kind of excessive trend towards one side of the needle one the needle was kind of shifted heavy one way and then it needed to be pulled back for the benefit really of everybody yeah on on that benefit um for those who don't understand really i mean obviously there is a a, a clear benefit of nobody wants to have surgery but in terms yeah. of the benefits of being able to rehab and return to your level of activity by avoiding surgery can you talk to listeners just a bit about that um in terms of you know the speed of which you can return to sport 
the fact that you don't have to face kind of the the risks around that come with having surgery. Yeah, and that's that's really important. So, I guess unnecessary surgery from a research point of view, but also from a healthcare systems point of view, is a very hot topic. And it's not just about knee surgeries. Like we're talking lumbar spine fusions, shoulder uh, arthroscopic techniques, um, some elbow surgeries that have been identified that basically are no better than placebo. And so it's this broader issue that we're realizing that a lot of the healthcare models that were set up to fund surgery were created prior to evidence-based practice where we, we, in essence, we want to have a really good study that we can apply to a large group of people where one group gets surgery and then gets rehabilitation after that. That's very good quality rehabilitation versus a group that doesn't get the surgery and gets very good quality rehabilitation. In ACL, that hadn't been done. So the, the actual reconstruction technique was proliferated from kind of 1970s onwards. And then in Australia, it was funded through Medicare. So the surgery was funded, but then there was kind of no funding for people or pathway even for people to actually choose for, to, to choose to not have surgery. So I think it's really important because there's costs associated with surgery. There's risks associated with it. There's, um, at times now we're realizing there's actually harms associated with it. So there's some, there's some meniscus surgeries that we've realized not only don't help, but actually increase the risk of arthritis by undertaking them. So that's quite scary and it's not something that we can necessarily sweep under the carpet. We kind of need to raise that with patients and patients need to be informed, but patients are still receiving those surgeries. So that's, that's really a big, a big problem. And there's, there's very, very good research that has suggested that and showing that. And there's a podcast. If listeners want to, want to have a switch over once they finish this really good one, they can, they can listen to the joint action podcast. And it was Teppo Jarvan and, and David Hunter, who's a rheumatologist here in Australia. And they were talking about this knee meniscectomy issue that basically it's, it's almost a runaway train. This, this, the, the surgery has been invented. We've tried to test it retrospect, retrospectively after the fact it had been, it's been rolled out. So millions of people have had this surgery and now they're realizing that not only is it no better than a placebo, but it actually, the patients are worse for getting that than doing an exercise program. That's a really big deal and something that patients need to be aware of. So as a researcher, as a clinician, as someone who has a platform, that's, that's part of the reason why I, I want, wanted to communicate this information, but also get it into the hands of patients so they can be informed. Yeah. Yeah. Someone told me that it takes around 20 years for, for research to, to be applied into practice in, um, in a lot of kind of medical fields. And, and it certainly sounds like, you know, some, some archaic kind of understanding of, of the essential nature of uh, surgery in the ACL topic has resulted in perhaps us fully over servicing from that perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah. And like part of that, I think the 17 years, it's like 17 years is the, the, what, what's put out, but I guess a lot of that, that is what we used to think, but there's opportunity to make that a lot more rapid fire in terms of new studies showing ACL healing because of the proliferation of social media. Yep. And so every day I wake up and I have patients contact me via email, website, uh, sometimes through direct message on different social media platforms. And I guess we used to think it took that long, but there's opportunity to make it a significant, a lot faster than that. If, if policies can change and if clinicians are willing to change, yeah, there is, there's definitely potential yeah. to make it faster than that. Yeah. Certainly from a, from a patient perspective, we want to see that kind of increased and more people will be given that, that balanced and, and research-based understanding before making that decision. Um, 
And I guess one of the bits that probably worth mentioning is is that decision. Maybe a lot of people are listening um, are in that that stage where they're deciding what to do post um, an ACL rupture diagnosis. And I guess the good thing about considering non-operative is it's not a decision in itself. It's you try it, and your plan B is your option B anyway of of surgery if you fail with with the rehab. Right. So um, I guess that's why you're quite comfortable in suggesting because I, I know a lot of a lot of people without the the mainstream kind of medical industry behind it might not feel entirely comfortable with encouraging the not to pathway but if you're not actually having to do anything other than rehabilitate until potentially the point of failure anyway which your worst case scenario is really surgery anyway so that that's certainly the way that i looked at it i said well why wouldn't yeah. you know, so go why wouldn't i give strength and conditioning a go get money stable and see how it goes and take it week by week knowing well, that i can always turn to surgery as a my yeah, second option absolutely yeah and some of the phrasing you know we the, to say that we're trying non-surgical that if you look deep into the surgical research, you could al also say that once you have the surgery, it's also a trial. Mm. Because if you look at the best of the best studies in reconstruction in the general population, only 50% of approximately 50% of patients get back to their pre injury status. And there's, again, depending on the, the quality of the study, but the best studies are suggesting there's quite a high uh, re injury rate of both the meniscus and the grafts can tear 30%. And so the patients need to know that even if they do choose the surgery, which is irreversible, this it, it's not a one-way ticket back to sport or necessarily a perfect knee. Yeah. And so I think, as, as you put though, definitely pragmatically, philosophically, you pretty much can't go wrong waiting because you can always choose to do surgery later if you need to, but it's not, you can't do the reverse. You yeah. can't have the surgery and then choose to go non-surgical after because the surgery is, is irreversible. And so this is what, and having participated in large scale discussions on this, interprofessional discussions on this, most, most of the thought leaders, the pragmatic, uh, researchers will agree that we should like a lot of other injuries. If you were to roll your ankle, it would be the same. Uh, there's international classifications that term an ACL injury or joint sprain, if we frame it like that, if you consider that you've sprained your knee, you want to wait and see how you recover. Most, most patients start to think, Hey, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm just going to choose this. And then either way, you're still going to be better coming out of surgery if it's at three to six months because your knee is less swollen. You have less pain. You can trust it more. There's more strength. And typically patients have less, less fear as well. And with that delaying surgery, there's a lot of the prehabilitation studies show that you get better outcomes long-term for having waited. So it is, I believe, and most commentators who have, who, where we can find middle ground agree with this, this approach. Yeah. 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 And certainly found from my experience, um, you know, with the non-optive approach, once you once you get into that rehab as well, it's a lot more um, motivational, a, a lot more engaging process. You're pretty much taking on the 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 role of a a bodybuilder in, in a in a sense of building those muscles around your knee, doing a lot of the strength work that a lot of people do in the gym, just as their pastime um, in terms of strength and conditioning to get your knee to that that state of real strong stability. Um, whereas I think with the the post-operative it's a lot more of a kind of arduous, tedious journey initially during the first few few months of that. And I think psychologically, there's there's a lot of kind of studies coming out around the psychological impact of post-ACL uh, reconstruction or, or, or just having a, a ruptured ACL is obviously a, a really tough period for any athlete or, or any person that experiences that um, to have probably one of the biggest loves and joys in your life taken away from you is really challenging. And for me personally, the reason I mention that is because when, when I was able to take control of my journey really by going when my physio said to me oh you might be able to get back in without surgery within six months but you know for elite athletes it's shorter and and for me that was a bit of a red rag to the bull in that oh why is that why is it shorter for them oh because they can train harder they can work harder. and I was like so this is in my hands the harder I train the harder I rehab over the next few months the quicker I get back to sport whereas for a um 
post-operative, really there's some hard guidelines around there, not before nine months because the actual new, um, well, the tendon turned um, supposed ligament is needs that time just to get solid enough to cope. So, yeah, I certainly, I certainly found that pathway a lot more engaging and a lot less kind of, I guess, psychologically deteriorating um, compared to when I was out for um, a year with my um, post-ACL reconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I see in the clinic. So the patients pretty quickly, like it might be within a matter of weeks because the joint is initially swollen after the injury, but then that starts to settle down. As their pain's becoming less, they start to trust it more. And then they, if they're weight bearing early on, then they start, they can return to work if they're self-employed or if they need to work or need to travel, they can return to that quicker. So it's, it, and then you don't have the second trauma from a surgery early. And then, yeah, there is, there's a couple of papers, I believe it's Hege Grindem and Stephanie Philbay, they wrote a, a, a case comparison where they looked at people who had early surgery, delayed surgery, or didn't have surgery and specifically looked at psychology. And the psychology in those people who didn't have surgery or had delayed was definitely better than those who had, had it early. Yeah. It, and you do, as the therapist, so I'm, I'm a therapist working with patients every day, you, you essentially, the whole, the whole philosophy is this kind of physician heal thyself, patient heal thyself. Like we want to, we want to shift the focus of control and locus of control towards the patient. We want to get them to ultimately manage themselves. And I think that definitely can happen quicker in the non-surgical pathway if successful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the big, big questions that people be listening, particularly with any more degree of skepticism, which we hope everyone has when they're, when they're listening and aren't just easily guided, um, is really around the, the mechanics involved in this. It's called the anterior cruciate ligament. It sounds very serious. Um, crucial. It's yeah, crucial. Very crucial, apparently. Um, I mean, I, so really, how, how does the, the knee cope, um, let alone play competitive pivoting sport without that cruciate ligament um, attached? Well, this is where it's, even in my own practice, Tim, and how I used to think has shifted in the past four years. So I, that 10 years ago, like I was saying earlier, when I looked at the best of the best studies, I assume, I, I actually did read some papers. There was a couple of smaller studies, 20 patients, 50 patients, 60 patients that showed the ACL could heal. But I kind of cast them to one side because I was more interested at the bigger studies that showed when you have the bigger and better quality studies, which showed essentially no difference between surgery and, and rehab. And so I started to think, okay, well, it was more about the patient's signs and symptoms. So their, their muscle system, I assumed that, I guess their ACL didn't heal, but could their muscle system cope? Hmm. And how their motor patterning, how the patients trusted their knee, how strong their thigh was, their quadriceps, their hamstrings, their, their, their leg, how strong that was, how their core was control over it, that kind of thing. And that's how I used to practice. I just used to just go on signs and symptoms essentially. But then I had this, I had a meetup with a surgeon and he said, well, look here and why don't you put your money where your mouth is and let's do a repeat MRI. Cause our training is that you're going to get more meniscus tears. Yeah. So how about we do another, if you don't have surgery. So how about we do an MRI and actually see. And, and so I started doing that and I started to see frequent healing, like yeah. over, uh, 50, 60% at least, which was was profound initially and now it doesn't really it doesn't uh, it's it's very exciting and i think i started to then go okay well what what's causing that is there some is there some way we can stabilize the knee early do we need to have a brace or does it is it just a heavy strengthening program and there's some there's actually a fascinating paper uh from the us that shows that it was about 20 odd pretty sure uh female soccer players <laughs> And they had, they did an MRI of their ACLs early on in the season. And they looked at their, they did a strength, strength and conditioning program over a season. And they followed them up at about a year after, and they looked at the MRI again and their ACL had significantly increased in size. So in the same way that you can build muscle with a strengthening program, you can actually build girth and bulk into the ACL. Wow. So I started to think, well, what if, 
what if we is that is that what's happening if early after the injury if we actually start putting tensile strength through the ligament that's yes it's torn but if the ends can find each other and then there's there's a, a collagen connection between them you can you actually start to build stability and there's been multiple studies that have suggested that that's the case and then we've got this new research suggesting that when you brace it that can further assist and so to, to your question about whether it's people coping or not, my my um, personal practice and also a lot of the social media focus uh, across disciplines and also in scientific debates has been can ACL tears heal? Hmm. And so it's almost like the it's become a side note that you can cope without an ACL, which absolutely is, is the case and true is true and supported by multiple peer reviewed studies, but it's what's happening when the patients first injure their knee. What are we doing to that knee? We can't just let people go out run around, go have a night on the town after they injure their knee. They have to keep it steady, stable. And there's some new theories about how we can best improve that. And some really cool studies that are showing the rate. It, it's not like a pie in the sky dream or some, Firthy that ACLs can heal. It's actually a high percentage. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say something that sounds a bit like what you just described there. In terms, I heard that or read somewhere that the initial idea that the ACL couldn't heal was based on studies on animals where their ACLs failed to heal when, let's say, did it with dogs and they. It repeat MRI scanned them and showed no healing and basically made the assumption that human heal healing couldn't happen based on that. Is that complete rubbish and we just can delete that? It's no, it's well, it's actually, no, I would not delete it from the podcast because that's, it, it is kind of, it is a really in retrospect, it's, it was a logical fallacy. Mm. So it was in the 1960s. I can, we can add the paper to the actual show notes. It's a, it's a, it's a published paper. And I'll, if you, if you, sift back through the studies that it, what tends to happen in academia is someone will come up with an idea and then a lot of people will quote that but ne not necessarily quoting the quality of it mm. and so it was in the study of dogs they had the acl resected and then they went in i'm pretty sure on arthroscopy and looked at the their knees and then they did x-rays and showed that they had arthritic change because none of them had healed mm. but what was missing is that none of the dogs were put through a strengthening program and none of the dogs had a brace. Yeah. So we, it's, we're not comparing dogs to humans. We're comparing dogs who didn't have a brace, didn't have a strengthening program and had their ACL cut. Yeah. So this is where in, in hindsight, it makes more sense when we go, well, if we, we're bracing, someone tears their MCL and we brace it, we see if it feels stable at at three months, if someone tears the PCL, it's the same. Someone tears the LCL, the lateral ligament, it's the same. Why haven't we done that with ACL? And there's now, there have been systematic reviews, so really good research studies that show definitely it can heal. We just need to try to work out in what type of full thickness tears, how do we get the best possible healing outcome? Yeah. So it's not, yeah, it sounds a bit, it almost sounds ludicrous. And I do actually, I give lectures on ACL healing and I pull up that dog study and then I pull up these pictures of dogs on wobble boards and dogs having braces and everyone laughs, but it's cause it is funny, but that's actually how you would best heal it. But it's quite difficult to work out when a dog first tears their ACL in, in the real world, but it's with humans, obviously they can vocalize it. They can communicate. There's a specific incident. So it's, it's harder. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like there's, there's ground for a whole episode on dog ACL healing, uh, ACL injuries and, and healing. Um, but maybe and I'm a cat person though. Oh, I'm okay. A cat well, person. We wouldn't get on that route because we <laughs> want an unbiased perception. That's what the show's all about. Um, yeah. we, we've, I mean, Stepping back into that, why that research hasn't occurred. Um, one one thing I pointed to to you um, when when we first spoke was maybe there's um, seven point two billion reasons why that research maybe hasn't advanced so much uh, in the surgical industry. But w we don't want to make this about yeah. you know the 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 financial bias and the reasons why maybe certain people are invested in supporting the surgical process versus the yeah. uh, non-operative one. What we do want to find out about is um, 
is really about how patients can can follow amazing stories uh, and how they can follow a pathway to success via potentially the yeah. of pathway. So another thing we've we've discussed um, prior to this is some of the the fantastic stories that we've heard out there from both. I mean, you've you've uh, rehabbed brought thousands of amateur athletes um, rehabbed about op- operatively. Um, yourself uh, but we've also shared a lot of stories about elite athletes that really doesn't feel like they're getting the coverage in the mainstream media as they should where we've we've heard of athletes returning to sport in months just a couple of months really after rupturing their acls yeah well just just when you were what you're alluding to in your question i do think i don't think we should shy away from the topic of uh, vested interests hmm. because everyone has a vested interest at some point but it's the the financial drivers in surgery are significant yeah it's it's significant and you know just a case example on the weekend i was running a course uh in interstate and a patient uh a therapist that i was speaking to said they had a patient who had um was doing really well and then they saw a surgical advocate in the public pathway, they were then uh, convinced, quote unquote, to then have a private surgery, which cost them $15,000. So in Australia and in the US particularly, it, it is a fee-for-service model. So to, I'm not saying it's the dominant driver, but it is a factor. And I think it's naive for us to think otherwise. Hmm. And so, so some patients don't know that, like they're not aware. Obviously rehab has a cost as well. And, but there's a couple of studies that showed quite drastic reductions in, in healthcare costs, you and I as taxpayers, we don't have, we, we could save the economy and arguably the patients who don't need to have it, it could be between 50 to 75%. And conservatively, that's probably $20,000 in direct and indirect costs. Because the patients who don't need to get surgery can get back to work quicker. They can contribute to the economy. Uh, the patients who really need the surgery can have it, but then e- e- the rehab, the, a rehab program in physio might cost $1,500, $2,000 Australian, but a surgery could be, depending on what's performed, whether they have meniscus surgery as well, it, it could be ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, but then it, you also have to have rehabilitation after that. Yeah. So I, so I do think, I think, the patients and that it's kind of an elephant in the room speaking of animals it's like an elephant in the room that no one really wants to talk about but i think it needs to be raised more and um it's it's especially when the best of the best studies show when your acl heals you actually get the best outcome more than surgery yeah so de- debatably if someone's offering a non-surgical program they could be charging thirty thousand dollars but but no one does that so <laughs> Um, I think conservatively, at least 50% of people don't, and I reckon it'll be, I mean, cross, cross bracing's nuts. Like that's 90%, but you were saying there's some about elite athletes. It's really hard with elite athletes. Cause I, I've had a f- quite a few engagements with, with high profile clubs, elite athletes, and it's different to the general population. Sadly, a lot of the athletes are more a commodity. Hmm for the club kind of like a business acquisition almost and so they don't necessarily want to be seen as wait wasting time considering non-surgical they just will make a cold calculated decision very early so you often see the elite athletes have had surgery within a couple of days and there are case reports in at the elite level where where patients have opted against that they just said, look, I don't want to do that. All the medical team have just said they don't want to do that. And it, it's really just that not enough people have dared to try. Yeah. Breaking and, down practical terms for, you know, Premier League Football Club, for example, the the most monetized league in the world and the problem uh-huh. leaders in, in terms of what the right protocol would, would be to follow. If they have a player that ruptures their ACL, they're going to want to sell that player at some point, right? And if that player is not going to be able to pass a medical because they don't have a reconstructed ACL, the value of that player has is dropping considerably or has 
lost all their their value in terms of resale. Is th- is that what you mean in terms of practical terms of yeah of, of the financial investment that that club have in that uh, well, asset? That's a part of it. There's many factors, and it could all it could almost be a podcast in itself. Mm. Yeah, we you could we could spend half an hour at least unpacking it all. There's a couple of research papers which we could add to the show notes, and if people want to contact me, I can send to them. Great, great articles. Uh, the lead author was Richard Wheeler. It was in 2015. There was an English, speaking of English Premier League, I thought the Saudi League was actually the most wealthy, but anyway. Oh, um, well, the players are now there. Jordan Henderson's on 700 grand a week, apparently, but I think... <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, but um, there was an EPL player who opted against... Uh, surgical advice to have surgery. He ruptures ACL, opted against that. I think he saw a couple of them, maybe two or three, and he returned in eight weeks and then played his last two years of his career with assuming without an ACL because he didn't do a follow-up MRI. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a- LODR right for his time at, at West Ham. Uh, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was, but there's a research paper. So they, that was published in the British Medical Journal and it was quite, it, it got, it made waves in, in research world at least. They then did a follow up to that paper. It's called Unknown Unknowns. And the assumption, uh, why are we making these assumptions with athletes that they need this early surgery? And the Richard Wheeler kind of unpacked why why this is happening. A lot of it is to do with resale value of the player, uh, perceived risk. Um, right. That's already been covered. I haven't actually read that, but yeah, that's a great article. And he kind of says, he, he actually concluded that, look, if we look at the best of the best studies in high level athletes, non-professional. So we're talking as high as you can go before becoming a professional. The outcomes are no different in surgery versus, versus rehab without surgery. And so he just said, well, we need to do it more. We need to try it more. Mm. And then just inform patients of the risk. And then there's been some other really quite dramatic stories where either the surgery, they've had the surgery and it's failed, and then they've just decided to play on without a graft, you know, with just further conditioning their leg. Or they've done, uh, the ACL's healed, and the players have returned quite rapidly. So it's... And with the new research coming out, that's essentially irrefutable that an ACL tear can heal. It's just going to, I think what's going to happen, Tim, in the next five years, hopefully, is we can try to identify early whose ACL can best heal compared to a graft, whose is unlikely to heal. And then the other, the other uh, voice in the room, which is often neglected, is the patients who probably should avoid returning to pivoting sport because there's... There's these, like I said earlier, you have these patients who, whether they do surgery or whether they do no surgery, actually by going back to pivoting sport, they're increasing their risk of having further injuries. And so they're probably wiser to just take up running, do tennis, Mm. skiing, CrossFit. They can still lead a very active life or just, or, or it's called adapting in research. It's called becoming an adapter, which is basically you just, you acknowledge, look, I'm probably of the certain demographic where if I try to keep going back to sport or if I attempt to go back to sport, I'm probably going to re-injure my knee whether I have surgery or not. So I should probably just take up something less aggressive. More people should be doing that. You know, it's quite, it's, it's quite confronting when I'm seeing a patient who's had multiple injuries, multiple failed surgeries, and that they never knew that they probably should have just, that they were running risks by going back to sport. Yeah, you know? and it, and it wasn't even necessarily in the, to improve their quality of life. It was just something they thought they should do. Yeah, making me so, wonder where I should be playing football anymore. So having a my course ACL twice doing that work, whereas when I play tennis, I never get any injuries. Um, there you not go. saying that you tennis go. is easy on the on the on the body at all, but yeah, that you don't have the studs in the ground twisting and and this is this is the thing. The factors. Well, like. you don't have someone trying to slide tackle you or, or or fly kick you in the back of the head in tennis normally. You know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I injured myself both times in my ACL ruptures, plant my leg twisted, and um, bye bye ACL. Um, yeah. Just a few names to chuck in there for people to 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 do their own kind of um, research around. Um, Mitch Short was was the um, 
the rugby player who returned. I mean, his story is just remarkable and, and maybe a bit of a anomaly in that kind of return of almost instantly returning after rupturing ACL, but then then had healing um, tolerance later and obviously incredible stability from muscular system of being rugby player and didn't lose any of that didn't have that muscle um atrophy that that would occur if you you're dormant for a few weeks afterwards like most people are when they when they have a bad injury um david byan um from dublin's gaelic team came back a couple of months after rupturing his acl and and um won the title in ireland and there's heaps of other stories that they're just gradually emerging i do think we're in a bit of a tip of an iceberg kind of moment where if we can if there is that big name who pops up and, and tries this and, and succeeds, that it will really fast track the conversation progressing and, and more people considering it because... Yeah, yeah. Like I, they tend to be, and the athletes are. Mm-hmm. The athletes are kind of sheep in that sense. So you, uh, when I had, I had a sit-down conversation with Professor Richard Frobel, who was the lead author of the Canon study, which was the first study I mentioned earlier that actually tested whether surgery is better than doing a rehab program. And he said that to me. I said, what about elites, Richard? And he goes, he echoed a lot of the same stuff we've spoken about. He said, Kieran, being conservative, at least one in two will be fine. At least one in two will be okay. They just need to start doing it. And then they'll probably all start doing it. So mm. he, he just said that someone needs to step out from the line, step out from the crowd and do it. And then they'll, it'll become a cultural trend. As I alluded to though, there are other factors and forces that are slowing that down or don't necessarily want to make that be something that's that's first on the agenda for, for athletes or general pop. Yeah, absolutely. Um, given what we've discussed about, and you, you, you alluded to the fact that Australia has um, you know, the highest ACL reconstruction rate in the world per capita, the USA, the UK, very similar high levels, um, remarkable in the UK given how underfunded the NHS is and uh, someone I spoke to was following the NHS they really said they don't support the non-optive and they're not best placed to you'd think if one if one organization was going to support non-optive it would be a, a financially drained NHS that oh yeah really should be looking into alternatives to to forking Absolutely. up the money that surgeons would charge them um yeah. but on the flip side um, we look over to Scandinavia and Holland in particular have a very different model in terms of um, rehab first and then consider yeah. surgery if stability isn't achieved. Yeah. They're closer to, I understand, around 50% rate in terms of um, reconstruction. Yep. And what do you yeah. think the correct referral process is in terms of you get your MRI result, you go to the doctor. Which, then In an ideal, well, an ideal world, you shouldn't get go to a doctor, you should probably go to a rehabilitation expert first, because if you do that, then they can best triage. And there's actually in the UK model, so it's called advanced scope physiotherapist, but basically or an extended scope physiotherapist where you act as a triage and you can actually be the point person who defers people away from unnecessary surgery and even unnecessary imaging. And so there is are some countries in the world where that's becoming adopted and you, you drastically reduce surgical wait times, you reduce unnecessary surgery, you, you, you improve unnecessary surgery. So that's what I think the model of care should shift towards. So whereas currently, as you said, you just go straight to it. You, you go to a GP or go to emergency, you get an MRI, then you go to a surgeon. Whereas you can kind of siphon people away from that with this different model. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying as a patient, you should book an appointment when you're You've got your MRI booked in, then you get to the, there and go, where do you want your MRI results sent? They should have a physio or a um, yeah. physical therapist that they go, that's the yeah. person I want it sent to because they're the person I'm going to discuss my recovery process with. That's that's how the model of care should be and could be. It's just whether it happens or not. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it, that would be the, what that's essentially what happens in Scandinavia. It's, yeah. that's, that's why the rates are heaps lower. Yeah. yeah. What percentage really of, would you say, people that have an isolated ACL injury yeah. should be having surgery? Well, I don't need I don't surgery. think it has to be an isolated injury. I think you can have a meniscus tear. Yeah, I was just, just trying to keep it simple conversation before we get, get into <laughs> you know, MCL grade 2, LCL grade 1, bone bruising. But you get into those kind of variables, right, and it becomes a pretty um, mixed conversation. But absolutely right in terms of, yeah. It yeah, doesn't. I'm not saying it. So how many factor? But how many people? 
Well, the the challenge is Tim, based on based on the there's been three control trials. There's actually a fourth one I was just reading about today. That's from Belgium. That's uh, about to be undertaken. Assessing this, it's a randomized control trial looking at surgical versus non-surgical, and it's different in the sense they're trying to predict. They're, they're going to look at predictive models. So, mm. how do we, based on the results of that study, when it comes out, which will probably be a few years. That will be interesting because then we can start to say prognostically, okay, well, you've got this type of tear, you're this type of person, you should choose this approach, which that's which that's not been done yet. Yeah. But what percentage? Well, based on those the, the current three best studies, 50% of people don't need ACL surgery and then the 50% who have it are no better for having had the surgery. So so that's, that's where we're at. But yeah. there are people who need it. There are people who need it. The main reason and criteria that I would suggest is if they have a, a gross episode of instability, despite having done three to six months of rehab, but you can improve. And I think this is where the research is going to go because in the Canon study, which was the first control trial, they didn't have bracing protocols. They didn't assess for healing. And so I think you could probably get you know, close to maybe, maybe closer to maybe 90%, 80, I don't think a hundred percent of patients can cope without surgery. I don't think that's the case, but I think it would be, it would, it will significantly improve from 50% if we can stabilize the knee early with a brace. And that's what some of these other studies are showing. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously the, the quality and, and advanced work in that, that rehab, I certainly found you having the, the ability to, to do really strong strength training sessions and, and build the muscles up around my knee rather than just a simple kind of, you know, get on a bike and then do some basic exercises. Oh, the yes. Single leg, hardcore, real oh, yeah. strong strength work supported by appropriate um, diet that's going to facilitate muscular growth in those areas. For me, that, that that's key to getting back well and getting back strong and returning sport. And I, I definitely think the, the other strength of this is that you should... 100% be returning to sport stronger and potentially faster than when you got injured because you're doing a strength yeah. conditioning program which is what you should be doing anyway and a lot of us don't to the to the to f the foreign nature that you're going to have to if you're going to get back non-operatively um that's just my perspective on it and the other, the other part that, that that I I really believe in from my experience is is the balance of that strength conditioning program I, I think a lot of us um are really training to accelerate aggressively and and this might be part of why the acl injuries have occurred so much but we're not preparing our bodies to decelerate aggressively to match that volume of um power and yeah. a lot of us are you know, a lot heavier than we used to be so everyone's building all this strength up doing all these squats getting huge um glutes and powerful hamstrings and uh, and exploding you see it in probably the nfl is the best example of that and yeah, that ligaments suddenly got a is being asked to be burdened with that deceleration because the decelerating muscles um, aren't conditioned to the same degree. And I think the the knees over toes guy on on um, yeah yes yeah on YouTube yeah. has really covered that so well in terms of training your body to decelerate and building that strength around when your knee does pass your toes as it does it when you play any sport. Oh yeah, like. Again, that's that could be a whole other topic in itself, but we have very, very good research that shows that if a patients are doing a preventative and strength and conditioning program, fifty percent of ACL injuries never ha need to happen in the first place. Yeah. So, so a lot of the patients that I see have never done any rehab, so they injure it, and so that's that's pretty depressing. That a lot of them probably it didn't need to happen first of all, but on the flip side. As you said, a lot of these patients, once once they start a strength program, they start to gain confidence in their knee, especially when they start to look at single leg exercises and um, return to sport drills and plyometric drills, these kind of things. I've had countless patients where they are better. They actually perform better than when they first injured it. And I think that's philosophically, it was never good to have the injury, but they end up in a better place. So... Yeah, look, as someone who oversees a lot of different clientele's rehabilitation and offers second opinion, where I look at other physiotherapists' rehab, I would say that that's a key message. Out, I think out of out of this podcast as well is that the patients are, are often underdosing. So the, the I don't know how your 
non-operatively managed knee compares to your operated knee. But what I see as an independent specialist looking at rehab programs is the rehab programs are way too easy. Yep. So they need to be considerably harder and it'll be, this is not a walk in the park. The patients have to do, it has to be intense, individual, individualized and, um, objective. So they need to be supervised. The, the, the patients need to be supervised. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably my biggest advice would be get, get an experienced physio who has, cause I think we often, if you haven't been through a, a, a serious injury, you kind of think all physios are, are equal and, and to book, book see a physio and they get a program, but get someone experienced with, um, knee injury rehabilitation, absolutely crucial for anyone around the world, um, approaching this as well. Um, I know I've taken up a fair bit of your time. I really appreciate it, but I wanted to to finish up on a really important subject that I think I'm hoping that maybe not directly, but uh, indirectly will be helped and, and we can hope to address by improving this conversation, which is really around the way ACL injuries and the um, prevalence of them are impacting women's sport. Um, Suggestions yeah. of up to six times more likely for a female to, to suffer an yep. ACL tear than, than a man playing football slash soccer. And, uh, uh, and another really s sad kind of detail that came out of another study was that 45% of females who do suffer an ACL rupture do not return to sport after it. Um, yes. So I wanted to get your yes. perspective, and I, I think this one runs across for everyone, but really what needs to be done out there to aid yeah. the prevention um, and to also to then get women back playing quicker, whether that's not optimally the bracing, basically yeah. team ACL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, my... I've got three daughters and so, and we're a very sporty family, very active that I don't want them to have a sustained an ACL injury. And it's obviously the genetically and biomechanically females are different. The hip, the hip and knees are different. So they are disadvantaged towards this ligament and it's actually higher than six times. It's like eight to nine times greater. The actual uh, likelihood of returning is pretty similar in massive studies, but there are some studies for certain sports for females, uh, in between 18 and 35 sports like soccer, uh, that, that there is a high risk of, of a second injury and not returning, as you said. And so we want to do anything, get, getting the message out, but particularly around these prevention programs. And it's, it's a no brainer that clubs should be doing them. Parents should be doing them. If you're a if you've got someone, a child, a girl who's under 18, you should, they should be doing it, but no one does them. If you actually look at the research, which is really scary. So that's a really, really important message. And we just, we need to make sure that it's, it's, it needs to be mandated, essentially mandatory. If you're playing sport, you need to be doing these programs. And, um, yeah, cause I've seen, it, it's really difficult. I've had one case where there's a young girl, she's 15, she's onto her fifth fifth surgery and wow. she's she's crying in my room and she's in, in my office and she's saying when is this going to end you know and how am i it's really it's really unnerving as a therapist to try and deal with that and counsel her and and she did she actually did her, her mom her and her mom sent me some footage of that she did eventually return to skiing which was great but her rehab program after the surgeries was also insufficient <laughs> so yeah there's a lot of work that we need to do but i think there's it it can change and i believe it's cha changing and you're also on that facebook group that we that we started which you which i'll give a quick shout out to yeah absolutely we yeah, look, we, it was actually Michael Ingle, uh, who started it in 2019. He's an advanced scope physiotherapist, a friend of my, really good friend of mine, a brilliant physio. He's called the, the musician dot physio. We started this Facebook group because every other Facebook group was surgery, 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 recovery from surgery, ACL surgery, recovery, this kind of thing. And so we thought, Hey, let's start an, uh, ACL plus meniscus tear recovery without surgery. And we're closing in on 18,000 members now, uh, very lovingly supported by Scott Harrison, who's another physiotherapist and Sean O'Keefe, who's a patient advocate. And we have a lot of positive stories and messaging and hope. It's like a hope filled community collaborating, wrapping our arms around each other virtually. And so 
I think those kind of grassroots movements are, are really helpful for patients as well, where they can get evidence-based advice that's balanced, but also supportive. And people can kind of have their hand held as they're walking on the journey from their injury and, and to recovery. Yep. That, yeah, it was such a valuable group to be in. And, and I, I jump in occasionally off of, off of my experiences, people asking, can I get back to tennis? Can I get back to football? Um, and what shall I be doing at this stage of the injury? And, and just sharing that knowledge with people who have been through it, I think, is so valuable. And I'd love to maybe start a bit of a buddy scheme as well, where we could, um, where we could get people partnering up with people that are going through it as well. Because having someone to answer those questions of what you're going through is is so valuable during such a long process. I'd also love to get um, some some athletes who have been through the non-active pathway. Alo Diara is my dream. I want to get the only Premier League footballer that we know has returned to sport to playing without uh, after an ACL rupture without surgery. We want to get him on the show as well. So if anyone um, knows of Alo Diara can contact him, that would be great to get on the show because we need to share more of these stories. We need to share more of the insight that, that you've brought us today um, about what really a, a normative pathway looks like uh, and the success rates. And I think it's definitely a sh- story and a subject matter we need to kind of blow open. I think the cross bracing method and the, the results coming out of that could be, you know, real ground shift as well, but accelerating um, everyone's understanding about that is, is absolutely key. Um, I really appreciate your time, Dr. Kieran. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. It's been great.